They're ancient hummingbirds, not the, of the type that we see today. Uh, notice that was done in 2003. Uh, in 2004, uh, 30, they, we found a 35 million year old uh, local uh, oligocene from the Northern Caucasus. Two fossils were there and the stem lineage of the modern hummingbirds are found uh, because uh, they have they first show a mod modified elbow. This joint uh, with the humerus at its head uh, is very important because this allows hummingbirds to fly up and down, back and forth, uh, upside down even. And the most important thing is they hover. And hovering is the way they, they do their feeding. And it's the most important. It's about the only bird that really does that in uh, regular time. 30 million years ago from Ger Germany, uh, there were two fossils, uh, fossils uh, found and they, they were named. And if you notice uh, in the Latin, uh, the first name, it means a hummingbird and the last name means unexpected because they meant they did not expect to ever find any fossils of this sort. And they were very lucky to get it. A fossil is very hard to make and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, the joint is important. It's, uh, it's, that's the sign that is really there. Uh, another complete fossil was found uh, in France in 2008. So these are all the first decade of this century. Here's what the fossil looks like. As you can see, it's not an easy thing to figure out what's going on there. You can see pieces of the wing, or pieces of the bill, and uh, uh, people that work on this thing can get pretty uh, good at identifying things. But for us just looking at it, I don't think we'd even know that was a fossil unless someone told us that. Now, the modern hummingbirds evolved. And one of the key people that I'm following or that we're all following now uh, is this Jimmy McGuire uh, out in uh, California, uh, Caltech. And uh, uh, he is at a big team of uh, people have time calibrated the phylogeny based upon nuclear substitution rates. He published uh, in uh, 4 April 2014, or, or you know, less than a decade ago, and they had examined 284 hummingbird species, used the systems of figuring out their ages. And so uh, they did several things. First, they confirmed that there were crowned species and dated them, and especially dated when they arrived in South America. Now, this is sort of interesting the way it works, and he had to sort of work this thing out. If the first fossils, uh, for 48 million years ago in Europe, uh, when they split, and 22 million years ago, the common ancestors uh, reached South America by leaving Europe. Now, his, how did they do it? The best definition that anyone has come up with, including Jimmy McGuire, is that uh, the birds that lived in Europe for some reason left Europe, crossed up over Asia, crossed the Bering Streets to Alaska, and then came south, down to South America to radiate into nine distinct lineages. Now, this is only a guess. Unfortunately, there's no fossils uh, between the uh, early ones uh, and their birds arrival in South America, but we think that is the most likely way that they got there. What we want to check on is the causes of rapid ev evolution. Uh, it, they are evolving faster than almost any other species. 10.6 billion years ago, the Andes uh, mountains rose uh, in South America. Well, so what? What they do is uh, they have a lot of nooks and crannies and little places where a uh, species can have a, uh, a, a few people, a few birds in this pocket or in this thing, and they will start evolving at a different rate and a, a, long, a long enough time and they'll become a new species as the Andes created all of this thing, certainly the number of species uh, noted that come from uh, the Andean area of South America is especially strong. Now, there's another thing that happens, it's called co-evolution. And uh, what happens here is uh, the hummingbirds love nectar and they love getting it. And uh, only certain, pl uh, certain plants have the kind of nectar that they would like. It's deep in the, Part of the flowering neck, uh, 
flowering plant and uh, they have to get down and get it. So the bills of the uh, hummingbirds are designed to do that. Uh, but in, in return, uh, as the birds are evolving, the plants are also evolving uh, to produce uh, uh, more nectar for them. And so they help spread the, uh, the flower, uh, the, the flowers are spread by the action of the hummingbirds. And you'll see more of that later on. 10 million years ago, uh, some drought resistant ancestors, when they were in South America, they were pretty well in the lowlands to begin with. Uh, but these are uh, more drought resistant ones, like the mountain gems and the bean clays, uh, recolonized in North America. They had come through there and now they came back and they, uh, they make up some of the birds that we know in Central and North America. Many other uh, birds came across when the Panamanian Isthmus was formed 3.6 to 2.6 million years ago. Now here's another phylogeny, uh, and this is just involved hummingbirds. Uh, what you see here at the bottom line in brown uh, is the uh, millions of years before now, and you can see at the very left, uh, the uh, 22 million years ago when they arrived in South America, that's when we start looking. And whenever there's a dot, there's two lines that go to the right, and those are tracing species. So here's 189, 184 species are all shown on this chart. Now the topazes were one of the early ones to do it, followed uh, by a lot more uh, that are hermits that are in red. Then there's mangoes, and you see a few black dots in there and then on up the line. And we're going to show you pictures eventually of uh, most of these different uh, clades, as they call them. Uh, he invented the word and it's a very good way of grouping it. They aren't species, they're just groups of things. And notice uh, the red ones for, uh, that have the brilliance there, the Andean clade, as he would call it. See how many birds are in there. That's because of the rise of the mountains and other things. And you thought we'd never show a picture of a hummingbird. Well, well we certainly like to. And here are three, uh, three of the fan, three of the different clades. The green hermit uh, here in the upper left here. Uh, you can see the bill, and you can see the kind of flower it works on. It's it's developed a curved bill, and the flower has developed the same kind of curving so that it can go down deep into the heart of the flower and get at the big nectar area. Uh, the bottom one here, the ruby topaz, some people consider it, it's the most beautiful birds, uh, bird there is in the hummingbird family. That's up to debate, but nonetheless, it is pretty. And back uh, when they, uh, in the end of the 19th century, when people were putting white plumes from aggrets in their uh, hair and in their, on their hats, they also had little stuffed uh, ruby topazes that they used as sort of a little button or a little handful of things that they put uh, clipped on the front of their vest or their shirt. And that was not a good idea, but they didn't, the ruby tro tropez survived all of that. The blossom crown was a bird that we had in the uh, uh, Santa Marta areas. And you see, it's got still a different kind of a bird. And you see how they're feeding on, on the things. So whether they're curved bills, straight bills, short or long, they all, could dig in and get at the heart of the flowers. Now, an interesting feature of hummingbirds was discovered. Uh, tetrapod dinosaurs from whom birds descended do not have sweet receptors. Thus, all avian DNA does not contain a gene that codes for a functioning sweet receptor. Most vertebrates, though, perceive both sweet and savory tastes and they have a family of receptor genes called T1Rs. The savory flavors are detected by the T1R1 to R3, the sweet by the T1R2 to the T1R3. In 2014, not too long ago, Maud Baldwin, while a grad student at Harvard, analyzed the genomes of 10 species of birds and found they had no T1R2 gene, no sweet receptor. But she did a second experiment, and this time she looked at a chicken, a hummingbird, and a swift. And indeed, she found that there were uh, hummingbirds did have this receptor for sweets. 
their savory receptors responded to sugar. 19 amino acids had been substituted in their T1R3 receptor. They had evolved the capacity to recognize carbohydrates. Today, hummingbirds consume nectar several times their body weight each day. Now, something that happens as a sort of interaction between the bird and the plant is pollination because as the hummingbird goes for the nectar, and the nectar is here at the base of the pistil and down low in the plant. So it has to have this long bill or long tongue and long tongue that's going to reach down beneath the reproductive parts of the flower and get to the nectar where it usually is in most flowers. And, but in the meantime, it will brush off and against the stamen. And then the tip of the stamen in the anther is where the um, pollination uh, opportunity occurs because the pollen sits here on the anther. So hummingbirds often have, as they move their bill down into the base of the uh, flower there, they will also get pollen grains along their bill and carry that from plant to plant, flower to flower. So they're pollinating while they're gathering nectar. The plants get a benefit, the hummingbird gets a benefit. And they love, they have very good perception for red and they have very often seen uh, feeding on hummingbirds on red flowers. But interestingly enough, just a little add in here, there are some butterflies that also help pollinate when they're gathering nectar. And there is a flame azalea down in the Appalachian Mountains in the central part of our country where these long um, anthers, see where the, the pollen is out here at the tip of the anther, uh, because these large butterflies are getting into the flower, they're passing by these long um, pistils and stamens, and they are actually collecting pollen on the wings. Uh, and they're just the right size to be able to capture some of the pollen at the same time as they seek the nectar through their tongue. And here's another fritillary that it has that same capability. But another piece of research that's been done um, in 2015 was done by Alejandro Rico Guevara and Margaret Rebecca. They were at the University of Connecticut and they were examining how a hummingbird's tongue actually operates. And they discovered that it is not a capillary tube. Think of sucking things up through a straw. That's not the way it happens, but it's a fluid trap and the tongue protrudes out towards the nectar. And as it does, the tongue opens up and there are these grooves on the edge of the open tongue that actually trap the nectar in them. The tongue is then withdrawn. You can see the tubes here. The tongue is then withdrawn. You can see it going into the nectar. Here are the, uh, it opens up and these uh, trapping of the, nectar, they pull it back in through uh, the bill. And as they do, the bill squeezes out the nectar and then the bill, uh, the sorry, the tongue flips back out and goes back to get more. So it's a fascinating process where um, it is not capillary action. And a very fast process. And they can do as many as 18 times in a second. And now how much nectar do they get? These wings flap up to 90 times per second and their heart rates may exceed 1200. Um, my oh no. video is gone. Here we go. Um, okay, and the drinking hummingbird can lick its tongue into a flower up to 18 times a second. As I said, they consume their own body weight a three gram hummingbird drinks has been known to drink 43 grams of sugar water in a day. And they consume half their body weight in bugs and nectar, feeding 
often every 10, 15 minutes, visiting maybe one to 2,000 flowers a day. Why don't they get diabetes? Uh, it just is extraordinary. Uh, much of the sugar though, that they quickly um, absorb, uh, they actually don't absorb it. It goes directly to the muscles to fuel that constant buzz of the wings and that rapid heartbeat. And of the other sugars though, wind up in the liver where they're supercharged enzymes that process them into fat. And that is very important for those hummingbirds that migrate. And Bob will tell you more about that later. And as soon as they take off, they start burning those fat stores that they have. And the ruby-throated hummingbird has a 600 mile flight over the Caribbean and it really must store an enormous amount of fat to be able to do that. Now, as I said, they also include insects in their diet and watch in the upper right here in this video, the bill comes down and the lower bill drops at an angle. And you can see it here in the pictures down below, the bill is straight and then it suddenly bends here. And this obviously must allow them to have greater area in which they can entrap insects. Another feature that hummingbirds have is iridescence. This is not a pigment issue. These are structural colors. It means they're reflected by microscopic structural features of the feather surface. Structural coloration is iridescence and it varies because of the change of light incidence. The gorget, this often this throat area here uh, is due to uh, the iridescence there is due to large stacks of melasomes in the feather bobules. They're arranged in layers separated by keratin. And it depends, the color that you see depends both on that Venetian blind effect of the arrangement of the barbicules and the V-shaped angular arrangement on the opposite sides of the bob of, of these barbicules. Watch this video and you'll see on the left the different hummingbird species that will be illustrated. This is a ruby-throated hummingbird and notice as it turns and is able to capture the light it turns from red and then going out of the light. Here's the second, this is a violet crown wood nymph. I'm sorry, green, green, green crown. Brown, crown brilliant. Notice the color on the brow. This is the female. Now here's the crown wood nymph. Just an exotic bird. Look at the, the shade of blue and green. And this is the male green crown brilliant. Now look at how that blue sudden patch suddenly opens up and look at what happens. What the female sees is this fiery throated hummingbird. Isn't, wouldn't you be excited to see that? It is just absolutely amazing. You can see the habitat that it's in. And the last one is the Talamanca. It's been recently split from the um, You're hitting with your right finger. I'm sorry. I'll get up. Sorry. Yeah. The next issue. Let's see if we can. The next issue we want to look at is courtship. Uh, you may have seen the uh, ruby-throated hummingbird in your yard doing his courtship. He'll start and he'll dive down going 40, 50 miles an hour. He is, um, the tail emits noise and he gets down here to the lower portion where the female is sitting. And at that point, she gets at an angle where that color of his throat, that iridescence appears. And he's reaching his maximal speed, then he goes up and he'll come down again. 
And she is positioned so that she gets to see that fantastic throat there at that moment. It's really quite dramatic. Now, torpor is a hibernation state that allows these hummingbirds to conserve energy by slowing down their metabolism, heartbeat, and respiration rate at night when the temperatures drop. When it's cold, they can reduce their metabolic rate as much as 95%. Some hummingbirds have been able to adjust to living high in the Andes with this capability. The Andean hill stars, one of those species, consumes up to 50 times less energy by reducing its core temperature to a level barely able to support life at night. Here are some pictures of hummingbirds sleeping or in torpor. I've never seen it. I really would love to see this someday. Isn't that amazing? Now we're gonna start down our per personal memory lane with these 10 species. And as Bob said, the formation of the Andes occurred when the continental crust and the ocean crust met and pushed up the mountains. Uh, you can see by this, particularly the right-hand piece that the Andes are amazingly uh, distributed in South America. Up here in Colombia, you have a three-pronged um, branching. Three, three ranges, actually, of mountains. Three ranges of the Andes <clears throat> in Colombia. Now, the giant hummingbird, uh, you would not remember it better, but it's a clade by itself. It's the only way to handle this bird. It's huge. See, it's eight inches uh, long and weighs seven uh, uh, point seven grams. That's less than most sparrows, but it's still huge for a thing. It's called a, it's clade, it's Patagonia, and it's found not alone in Patagonia, the southernmost part of Mexico, a uh, southernmost part of South America, but it also uh, is uh, found up in the high areas uh, the Par Paramo and the mountain areas of the uh, most, uh, several of the Andean ranges have this bird. So it is fairly widespread. It has another thing. Notice it's sitting. We said birds always feed by hovering, but this bird flies at much slower, uh, flaps at much slower rates, and it, it loves to sit down and eat this way, almost like a regular kind of a bird uh, by doing it. So. Uh, it's uh, it's an interesting bird to uh, see, and the one that is uh, here. This is another one. Now here is <laughs> if you can't hear this video, I'll talk over it a little bit. This very small, the smallest hummingbird. times a second they can be. weeks have passed since the hummingbird eggs were laid and she's now feeding them this yeah. nectar. Notice the lichen on the edge of the nest. Where 
notice that the females and the uh, young birds are very bland colored. It's only the bright colors are usually in the male. That's a courting outfit. He gets dressed up, but the female does most of the work. She builds the nest, feeds the young, and otherwise takes care of everything. He's gone off to find another mate. Now, the next species we'd like to talk about is one that is up in that paramo, way up high. We were at 12,000 feet. Isn't that glorious habitat? And in this habitat is this Espelitia, uh, a plant that is favored by this particular hummingbird. There's a national park up there. And here is this wonderful buffy helmet crest hummingbird. It's a species you can see that has a gorget here that is not visible over here just because of the angle of the light, but they, the female may eat as many 2,000 insects a day, and it will range up to 17,000 feet. This was a very exciting day that we found this bird. Another bird that we loved was the streamer tail. The streamer tail is a a bird from Jamaica. And as you can see, if you go into Montego Bay, into Rocklands, you may find uh, this uh, particular hummingbird perching on your finger and feeding from a little bottle of sugar water. It is the most exciting experience. Robert Sutton uh, was the famous ornithologist there on the island and he, uh, showed us great many of these birds and uh, actually helped David Attenborough film them for their mating. Uh, here we have crowned wood nymphs at the El Dorado Lodge in Santa Marta. We were there. This is a, a mountainous mass on the northern edge of Colombia. And late in the day, they were in feeding for the, to get enough energy to spend the night. You can see how dark it was uh, in that last picture. Uh, and that's because it was almost dark. But the reason that these birds can show all this iridescence is if you have a light behind us, like a, flat, like a spotlight or an overhead light, and you, the camera, and then the bird. And if they're completely in line, that allows the, uh, uh, the iridescence to show. And that's what's happening in this picture in front of you. We, uh, next day, we, during siesta, we left the door open and one came in and it was in front of our big window when we were so fortunate to be able to uh, have this close up view of this crown wood nymph. You want to see Dana catching the thing. Uh, we had a big house and it took a little while for her to grab it and catch it, but it was fun. We visited San Francisco, a town not far from um, Bogota. And I've never seen a woman who really had managed to turn her hum a yard into a hummingbird sanctuary. This was extraordinary. I think we had 10 species of hummingbirds here between her red flowers and her multifarious hummingbird fetus. It was quite exciting. So try and visit San Francisco if you go to Columbia. Okay, the sword-billed hummingbird now is uh, has the longest bill. We're doing some of the extremes in there. And you can tell the bill is uh, 10 centimeters long. If you take your second figure from the knuckle to the end of it, that's 10 centimeters. And that's the length of a of a bill. They're huge to see it. And uh, one of the things uh, that makes it interesting is they can do very well. They certainly can get into very long uh, tube-like flowers. And uh, they have little trouble down here with the typical bird feeder, but they can do pretty well. But one of the things that they used as an example is they evolved at 10.1 million years ago. And these three flowers or plants that have high nectar producing things evolved at exactly the same time and have continued to uh, 
co-evolution. Uh, both are helped by working together to uh, produce more, more flowers and more uh, nectar for birds. The booted rocket tail, another favorite one of mine, it's called booted rocket tail because they claim that this area here where these puffy white feathers are uh, boots and that's the uh, source of that word. And the racket tail, just an absolutely exquisite hummingbird. I'll never forget how lucky I was to see it when we were at Machu Picchu. Just a very spectacular hummingbird and loves these tubular flowers. Now, another bird, the, there seems to be another um, video going at the same. Here we are in Peru. Here we are with this, and these are novelist spatula tails in Peru. Know how to get rid of this. and Steve Fleming on for this episode about one of my favorite topics, consciousness. Notice the four tail feathers of this marvelous spatula tail. Now, here we have the, oh, sorry, Bob. Okay, <clears throat> if you can hear me over the background noise, the Rufus hummingbird is a North American bird. In fact, it, uh, it has the longest migration route uh, and it, it, it nests in Northwest uh, United States up through coastal Canada and uh, even up to Alaska. And it migrates down to the uh, uh, Central America area near Mexico City and south. It flies about 25 miles per hour, which is typical for hummingbirds. Or are generated by your internal process. No, I, can't, I can't do it. Gives this to yeah. a generative yeah. adversarial okay. network. Uh, uh, this hummingbird comes up along the coast of, uh, uh, of uh, along the Pacific coast and goes uh, all the way up, as I said, to Alaska, and it comes back down through Colorado and the more inland route. Uh, some recent people have been uh, seeing the timing they're coming up because they seem to be late. The flowers are blooming that they need for nectar and to feed the young. Uh, and 
they haven't even arrived yet. So the, the roof is hummingbird is going to have to adjust these things because uh, climate change has uh, sort of altered the timing of the flowers and the birds have got to adjust. The ruby-throated hummingbird is our hummingbird. Uh, it breeds in the eastern two-thirds of the United States, so we all know it. So I'm going to take a little couple of minutes and talk about it. Uh, it weighs three grams, which is a typical hummingbird uh, weight, uh, and uh, it winters uh, south of the Gulf of Mexico for the most part. Uh, the, now, how it migrates has been debated by people. Somehow the light, they see a change in light, or maybe they see a change in their food. So when the food starts drying up, and maybe they know it's time to leave, but either way, it's affected basically by light. Uh, the males feel leave first, uh, and uh, they go all by themselves, uh, south or north, depending on which way they're going. The females, 12 days later, follow along in the same area. And five days after that, the young well, uh, fly by. They average 23 miles per day, which seems rather odd, but they what they do in a day is that they're migrating. They'll have a big meal at the early on. They'll fly for a few hours, and then they'll stop and, uh, and for the at night. Uh, we use these references here. Uh, all this I'd be happy to share with any of you. And we certainly want to conclude by saying we hope you've enjoyed our tour of all these wonderful features of hummingbirds and this uh, friendly tour of 10 special birds we've enjoyed. We want to give special thanks to David for inviting us to the York County Audubon for hosting us and to all of you for watching. My email is there and over here if you uh, have any feedback, please feel free to uh, contact me at dana.fox1939 at gmail.com. We'd love any of your comments. Thank you so much, Dana and Bob. Uh, that was one, wonderful pictures there and so much information. I'd like to start by mentioning that uh, this program uh, Dana, if you could uh, stop the screen share. What I was going to say is that uh, the program has been recorded. Uh, my apologies for missing. Thank you, likewise. So we're going to get into some gritty. Okay. Um, I'm going to. The program has been recorded and when it will be available yeah, on our website. Yeah. What's that, Dana? Sorry, I've been having more trouble with that. Um, now we're fine. Good. Okay, good. Great. Uh, there was a ton of information in there. So if you'd like to look at the uh, program again, it will be available on our website. We do have some questions that I'd like to jump to. Um, First about the uh, bee hummingbird. Is that only in Cuba? Yes. It okay. is an endemic we... to Cuba. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, yeah. we were there in 2000 and we were watching Paul Basich give a talk about it. Uh, and he was there just earlier uh, this year, last year. And uh, they now are actually feeding from feeders. There are people who have set up areas where you can go and watch it. It's it's amazing what they've done uh, so that you can see that bee hummingbird, um, which didn't exist when we were there, what, 12, 14 years ago, yeah. Yes, and, and the hummingbird, the uh, bee had originally come north with the uh, Panama area being land, they could move north. And they, so they came up to our area and then went over to Cuba. So they made several trips. 
most of the, in fact, all of the hummingbirds that are on the islands probably moved from uh, the, the Northwest onto the, onto the Caribbean islands. None of them evolved there. They sort of worked it that way. And the bee hummingbird is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. We have several questions about how to uh, best, best uh, invite and uh, hummingbirds to one's yard. Uh, I think that uh, first you should make it as natural as possible. Uh, many of the red flowering plants, bee balm, um, uh, there are a whole series of uh, plants that uh, some salvias, some agonaste that uh, people can plant to attract them to have as a natural food uh, and uh, also feeders. We uh, try and make sure that our feeder is bear proof, i.e. get it up uh, for those of you that have to worry about bears, uh, get them up uh, high, uh, raise them up there artificially if you need to, to, to get that clearance. But uh, the summertime is just a delight to be able to have them come into your own feeders. Uh, so some natural food and yeah. and feed and your feed is there. Right. And if if you have the feeders up early as the birds are coming in, uh, they they may decide they're going to nest nearby, which is perfect. And that's what we have up in uh, in New Hampshire, and uh, we work it that way. And uh, long about the end of June, the hummingbirds have arrived. The males are there, and they're even doing the courting action. That loop the data showed on the thing, you can actually hear sort of a boom or wow, uh, a noise as the bird comes down trying to uh, uh, entice the female to uh, partner with them. And that goes on. All you have to do is have the hummingbirds out, uh, feeders out, before the hummingbirds get here and you have a good chance of getting some. Yep. And so, uh, some basics for, if someone's new to feeding hummingbirds, the, the feeders are themselves are red, but the liquid does not need to be, nor should no. it be colored. No. I do uh, not you... use any coloring. I make my own right straight from sugar water. I use a cup of, uh, water to a quarter cup of sugar. So you don't need colored liquor, liquid. There also are some extraordinarily wonderful hummingbird feeders. I first saw them in Arizona where there's a suction cup and you can put it right on your, your window and they come right up to the window. That That is really neat. Um, it's just, it's like having a test tube, you know, uh, that can stick on the window uh, and have a little hole at the, uh, uh, the open end of the thing. And the birds come up if they got a place to stand, or if they can't, they'll just hover in front of that thing and, and feed off the thing. And uh, that's foolproof, very easy to do. Now you worry about red. The hummingbirds have a, a, a filter in their eye that we do not have, and they can see more colors than we can see. And red is a, a very attractive color to them. And so because their eyes are picking it up better than ours, uh, they are drawn to red. That's why the feeders are often called red. And sometimes when you're sitting there watching them with a red shirt on, as Data and I are right now, they would come over and, and just hover right around us because they're drawn to red. So red is important. I had a, a muumuu on with big red flowers on it one day and stepped out onto our deck and the hummingbirds were coming up to me to, to the red flowers on, on the muumuu. But an important thing with a hummingbird is to be sure to wash them, clean them thoroughly once at least once a week, particularly in the warm weather. Yes. And, and what, what, what comments do you have on having more than one feeder uh, to allow for competing hummingbirds and how should they position, be positioned, how close to one another? Uh, I will have uh, two feeders on maybe 30 feet apart uh, in my cabin. Uh, and then I may have two of these uh, tubular feeders, you know, just uh, on windows or on a stake even in between. Uh, and I'll have many wildflowers or many 
flowers that are attractive to them. Um, and I, in fact, I'm just ordered some bulbs from, from called Carcosmia, I think it, they're called. Beautiful red flowers that are very attractive for them. There is a bulb that you plant. Um, and uh, now I, I might add, add this feature. If uh, the uh, male hummingbird uh, gets a feeder that way, it becomes his territory like that. And so he will shoo away uh, birds, especially hummingbirds that are not related to him particularly. And he'll sit on a branch maybe 20 feet from the feeder. And as soon as a rogue hummingbird comes in, he'll chase it away. So two feeders sometimes will allow uh, more activity to go on. I mean, that, uh, and that, that's the way we find they don't work the two feeders together. They work them separately. And sometimes birds will go to one or another and they learn to use that feeder as their primary source of, of, of nectar. In the Southwest in Arizona, people may have 15 or 20 feeders up along the back of their house, in, particularly in some of these places that uh, feature uh, hummingbird uh, and, and encourage people to come and see their hummingbirds. So more the merrier. It, and in addition to your comment about keeping them uh, beyond the reach of bears, uh, are there any other comments you'd make about what height or location in a yard or proximity to your house or deck? Uh, uh, any recommendations at all? Um, I think that, um, oh, oh, another thing that you will find the we find two other species of birds are going to the hummingbird feeders. One, Baltimore Orioles will come in, particularly in the early uh, um, portion in May, June, uh, because they don't have enough natural food that they've found yet. And then all summer long, my downy hummingbird has turned into, I mean, my downy woodpecker has turned into a hummingbird. He's been drinking the nectar water. I do not know what is happening to hummingbirds yeah. in my yard, but, and to woodpeckers, uh, downy woodpeckers and hummingbirds both going to the same feeder. Uh, I think that you want to have them up off the ground enough so that they're not attractive to uh, anything that may want to uh, feed on them. Uh, by putting them on the end of the house, as we do up there, uh, we don't have the problem of animals, particularly coming up like a chipmunk or a squirrel or something of that sort. And they, they, will, they will watch the birds going in, but they have no desire. Uh, we only have one kind of an animal, and it works at night, and he's very small, and he comes out and drinks it. Do you know what it is? Yeah. Uh, a flying squirrel? Right. Flying squirrels are the only things we've seen that, that really go after them. And of course, they can do it. They, they can jump and land right uh, right near the feeder. And we're convinced uh, it'll be full at sunset. In the morning, it'll be almost dry. And that's the only thing that can have done it. Uh, also, there are little cups that you hang. I hang from the hook and then the feeder from the cup. Uh, because that keeps ants out of you. They're attracted. And yeah. late in the summer, uh, we find the yellow jackets are coming into the feeders. And there are some uh, bee guards that they have that are in certain types of feeder. I was looking, there's a certain type of feeder that supposedly uh, the, the bees can't reach down in with their proboscis as well as um, a hummingbird can with its tongue. Mm -hmm. What do you uh, use to uh, clean, wash and clean the feeders? Is just dish soap uh, acceptable? I, I think the answer yes. is yes, as long as it's you rinse them thoroughly. Right, and wow. I have a little scrub brush that I use because mildew will set up if you don't um, keep watch on that and you want to scrub off that mildew. Do you know what the uh, normal arrival date is for hummingbirds in, in your county? Or what would, well, you, what would you estimate? I know probably that 
the first week of May, you're probably going to start seeing them um, there for sure. And um, by mid mid May, they ought to be in. And um, we have them as migrants here in our yard in North Andover. We don't have enough woods. They really like more woods um, there. Um, uh, and up at the cabin, we're right in the woods on the edge of a lake. So we have them there, but uh, they're only passing through here in North Andover. One thing you could, if you keep the feeders open in the late fall, uh, you'll see the uh, males leave, then the females, and then the young. And you say, well, that's the end of it. But if you leave your feeders up uh, for a time, occasionally a migrant from the West will come in and, uh, and be around. And that's, that's an amazing story to see, a, a, for example, a rufous hummingbird coming into your feeder in late October or so forth when all the, uh, the uh, ruby throats are down crossing the Gulf. And that's good. If you were living down in the southeast of the United States, uh, the uh, again the uh, uh, rufous hummingbird, ha by going in the wrong direction occasionally, as some of them will, have gone down there and found feeders, have learned to go back to those feeders, and they come back every year to their feeders. The same birds come there, so they fly really from northern Florida to uh, southern uh, Alaska. Uh, each day, each time, rather than going to uh, South America. So you, it, I don't guarantee that you could do it, but if you leave it out, it might happen. And it's certainly a thrill when you have a, one of these uh, array, rare hummingbirds turning up at your feet. Mm -hmm. well, our, our ruby throats who, who visit us here, where specifically do they migrate to in the winter? If they go down, our, we're right on the coast. And remember, they, they range all the way out to the Rocky Mountains. So ours go down the coast and go into Florida. And uh, some will cross island hopping or so forth so that they can get across the area. And others that are from farther west will go to the Gulf and then go around the west side of the Gulf because they all want to end up on the uh, southwest side of the Gulf of Mexico, and they reverse the direction when they're coming up in the spring. It's a, they're, they're already well up into the uh, uh, lower southern states now, and because they move slowly, but they'll they'll get here, and that's a, that's another sign that they're coming. Uh, is the uh, a warm days will bring them along. Do you have? Uh, you mentioned before, Dana, that. Uh, you might like to share an email if people right. have questions for you. Right, and and also if you have any comments about the uh, the presentation, we'd love to have them. We always are trying to improve it and uh, try and in this one we took an unusual, you know, bent trying to talk about the recent research and then some of the species. Uh, it was interesting we always have these great debates and discussions about how we're going to make a presentation. So um, we're ha happy to have comments from people who've seen it and see what they like or don't yeah. like. We've probably done it two or three times. We've got half a dozen more showings probably coming along with other groups and so forth. So uh, you could help us improve it. And what should we do more? What should we do less? Is it too technical? You know, those sort of questions. But uh, I think the te the recent technology has so moved ahead of people's general knowledge about it. We thought that was the most important thing to emphasize. And you can see what's happened in the last 20 years. 20 years ago, we would not have given this talk at all. We would have talked about the hummingbirds and showed pictures of the ones in South America and a few in North America, but never all this detail that you're seeing tonight. Uh, I just saw on the chat a question. The email is Dana, D-A-N-A -A dot Fox, F-O-X, 1939, a good vintage year, at gmail.com. So Dana dot Fox, 1939, at gmail.com. Thank you, Dana. And uh, the recording will be available within a couple of days, should be up on our website. Uh, Dana and Bob, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, wonderful to share some of your adventures and 
and see some of the research highlights that you've shared with us. Thank so, you, Bill, thank ever you, so Randy. much. And thank yeah, you yeah. to all of you listening tonight. It was great fun. Yeah. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.